security amid a pandemic. I am Mark Roselle, the Dean of the Sharp School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And this is the fourth in a week long series of noon programs that we are doing webinars on various public policy issues and the pandemic. I'm absolutely delighted that this event is being run by the Michael Hayden Center for Intelligence Policy and International Security. People have been participants in programs in the past uh, that the center has held live, some of them at the National Press Club, where we've had upwards of 650 or more people attend. And interestingly, we raised the question in this virtual environment, would we be able to continue at that level of success? And I see that we've had about 800 people sign up for today's session. So I'm absolutely delighted by uh, the widespread participation today. And I very much look forward to uh, this discussion. It's a one hour program. It's going to go really fast. So we're going to get right to it. Uh, I would like to turn it over to Larry Pfeiffer, the director of the Hayden Center, and he's going to introduce the panel. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. And I uh, really appreciate everybody coming out. I know there's a lot of competition out there in the digital world for webinars and events like this. And so the fact that uh, you took time to join ours uh, is greatly appreciated. And I think it shows that there's obviously a lot of interest in both uh, the pandemic and what the intelligence community is doing about that. Um, wanted to uh, do a couple of quick introductions. We've got uh, uh, Michael Morell participating with us today. Michael's a former deputy director of the CIA, served you know, 2010 to 2013. Uh, twice as acting director for a total of six months. Uh, he is a senior fellow at the Hayden Center and a distinguished visiting professor at the Shar School, uh, teaching a very popular class in intelligence analysis. Uh, he also hosts the CBS News podcast, Intelligence Matters. If you're not subscribing and listening to that, you're really missing out. Uh, he's normally the guy in the seat asking the questions. So uh, uh, thanks, Michael, for putting me on the spot and making me the question guy today. Uh, we have Glenn Gerstel. He served uh, as NSA's general counsel from 2015 to 2020, a good long stint. Uh, it probably explains the, uh, the the lighter color hair and the wrinkles around his eyes. <laughs> He's currently an advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, serving as an advisor on areas of technology. Uh, before working at NSA, he spent 40 years working at the uh, renowned global law firm Milbank, and his focus there also was on technology issues. Uh, Glenn's been beating the drum in recent years on uh, the cyber threat, most prominently in a New York Times op-ed in September entitled, I Worked for the NSA, We Cannot Afford to Lose the Digital Revolution. Uh, some quick admin comments before I really get rolling here. Uh, for those who haven't used WebEx before, if you want to see all the participants at the same time on your screen, if you go to your upper right of your video screen, there's a circle there that gives you a choice of different views, one of which is the grid view. Uh, secondly, questions. We're going to be taking questions, probably beginning at about 20 minutes before the hour. Uh, we're going to take questions in a written format. You may notice on the panel on the right of your screen, there's a Q&A section at the bottom. If you uh, open that section, there's a field in which you can uh, write your question. Uh, so please uh, start thinking about questions and submitting them. Uh, there's a lot of you attending. There'll probably be a lot of questions. I guarantee you we're not going to be able to get to all of them, uh, but we're going to try to get to as many as we can. If you want to be identified when you ask your question, please type your name and an affiliation, if you'd like, in the actual question and answer field. Uh, otherwise, when we read your question, we'll present it anonymously. All right. So, Michael, I'm going to start with you. We've got uh, over a million cases of coronavirus in the country. We've got nearly 60,000 people have died in this country as a result of coronavirus. Uh, at the same time, we're spending $80 billion a year on our intelligence budget. And so a lot of people out there are wondering, oh, God, did the intelligence community blow it again? Did we have an intelligence failure here? Did we miss something? Should we have, should we have done better warnings? Uh, how would you, what would, be, what would be your take on that question? So, Larry, nothing like, uh, nothing like shooting right out of a cannon from, from, uh, from, from step one here. Um, I'd, say, I'd say two things. Um, one is that we don't know, you know, we all of us on the panel and, and the participants um, and pretty much anybody who is not part of the community or part of the policy community that consumes intelligence, we don't know how well the community did. We didn't know um, what it said and when it said it, um, you know, did, they, did it do as much collection that it 
could do? Did it ask the right analytic questions? How did it do answering those, right? We don't know any of that. And I doubt whether the community itself could give itself a grade at this point, right? So if I were the DNI or if I were the director of CIA, you know, at some point, not today, but at some point I would ask for a lessons learned um, look at how did we do and how could we have done better? So that's kind of point one, right? Too early to make a call on performance, but at some point we need to take a look at that. I think the second point is even more important is I don't think anybody should um, believe that the U.S. intelligence community has the fundamental responsibility in our government to be the entity responsible for warning of, epi of, 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 of epidemics in certain parts of the world, um, warning of identifying those epidemics, warning of pandemics, um, you know, the identification of pandemics. Um, we don't have the skills and the, the, the expertise in order to do that, right? In my mind, that fundamental job rests with the Center for Disease Control. That is their job. The intelligence community's question, right, to itself is, did we fully inform the CDC's call on those things? Did we provide them with the intelligence that they needed in order to make the call? So I'd make those two points. Uh, Glenn, any thoughts? No, I completely agree. Uh, I think, um, uh, as we'll, as we'll, I'm sure we'll get to in a, in a second, uh, we're going to talk about why, why it, it's important for the um, aperture of what we look at in the intelligence community to be expanded, as we said in uh, the article that Michael and I recently did and expand the, the definition of national security. But I think Michael makes a very important point, which that doesn't necessarily mean it then defaults to the intelligence community to find out all the information necessary. It's still the responsibility of those uh, organizations and agencies that have the true expertise, and it's the intelligence community's duty to try to to enrich that to the extent possible. Hey Larry, so, can, I just, can I just jump back in here for a second and, and, and maybe give a parallel that people might help them understand this. Um, you know, who's the responsible party in the executive branch for warning of and identifying financial crises, um, debt crises, currency crises in emerging market countries, right? It's not the intelligence community. It is the international affairs folks at the Department of Treasury. Those are the people who have that expertise. Those are the people who are interacting with all the right people to be able to do that. So then the question for the intelligence community becomes, are we providing them the right information? Are we telling them which countries are hiding financial data? Which countries are lying about their financial data? Where are politics playing a significant role in a potential financial crisis, right? But it's it's their fundamental responsibility to make that call. So it's very similar in my mind. So all that being said, um, <clears throat> we're seeing lots of press reporting uh, about what the intelligence community may have done. Uh, you see reports uh, that there were dozens of reflections of the virus in the PDB over the course of a couple of months. You see reflections in press about a possible uh, National Medical Intelligence Center report, uh, you know, very early on that was warning of this. Uh, at the same time, you you have these uh, entities, the DNI and NMCI or NCMI, um, offering nuanced denials of, of those stories. Um, how exactly would the IC be postured? What kinds of information would the IC be providing today as it's currently resourced uh, in response to this virus? Michael, why don't you uh, take that? Yeah, so I think, and, and this might be a good pivot point eventually, Larry, to, to our op-ed, um, because today I think we're postured to, to provide collection and analysis about what governments are doing with regard to an epidemic or a pandemic, right? Are they being honest about about what's happening in their country? Are they being transparent about what's happening in their country? Um, are they being transparent about, um, you know, what they plan to do? You know, are they being open? Um, so that seems to me to be what we're best postured to do today and how politics and foreign policy affects all of those decisions, right? Clearly some of the decisions made by the Chinese government 
were for their own domestic politics and for their own international standing. Um, so to help people understand all of that, I think that's our role. But in, in, in actually right, predicting that, that you, you know, a cluster of cases in Wuhan is going to become a global pandemic, that is a completely different issue at this point. But I think we could play a role in helping to understand that if we did the right going forward. And that's why we wrote the op-ed. Uh, Glenn, you know you spent five years up at NSA. You've got a, a you know a window uh, from your many years of experience into into uh, technology. Uh, any additional thoughts on what Michael had to say from perhaps an NSA perspective or or a cyber perspective uh, with regard to resources that may have been being applied against this problem set? I think I'd echo much of what Michael said. I mean, uh, clearly the intelligence community doesn't have the experts right now in infectious diseases and a whole range of matters that I think are going to be increasingly important as we realize that technology has made our world so interdependent. There are all sorts of complex dependencies and relationships that we don't fully understand due to te technological change over the last decade or two. And our intelligence community simply isn't postured to pick up all that. We're, we do a terrific job at understanding political and military threats, as Michael alluded to. We, we understand uh, North Korean missile systems, Russian submarines, you name it. Uh, and we certainly have a good handle on understanding the uh, leadership intentions of, of some of our adversaries. Uh, but in terms of this broader aperture of what, what other, other matters we should be looking at, um, I don't think we're as well positioned. Uh, we're, we're lagging behind technological developments. And we clearly need to move the intelligence community, in my view, into a position where it's able to look at some greater matters that, that will affect our national security here in the United States. What happens in China can affect what happens on our supermarket shelves here, and we need to be in a position to deal with that because, because that is, in fact, our national well-being. So uh, pivoting into your op-ed, which you both have uh, begun to do, um, you and for, and for those outside who aren't familiar with the op-ed, it was published on April 7th in the Washington Post, and it was titled Four Ways the U.S. Four ways U.S. intelligence efforts should change in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, kind of working our way through the four, the first was this idea that perhaps there is a need for a fundamental shift in uh, in the IC mission, in IC priorities. Um, clearly, there's an issue, for example, uh, when a U.S. aircraft carrier uh, is sidelined in the docks without a shot being fired. Uh, that definitely, it, it, that's one specific area where um, there are risks we maybe had not identified fully before. Um, Michael, what are some of the other risk areas that we need to be addressing as we move into a, a post-coronavirus uh, intelligence posture? You know, I agree um, fully with what Glenn just said about the need to expand. Um, you know, no surprise, we both wrote the op-ed together and we agree on every word in it. Um, you know, um, we do right we do have a tendency to focus on quote traditional national security issues and what glenn and i are saying i think at the end of the day is you know there's a really a wider range of issues than just the traditional issues that affect our national security and boy does the pandemic drive that home right because at the at the end of the day the lives of americans you know are 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 probably the most important thing we're trying to defend right and so it's clearly a national security issue. So there should have been, you know, over the years, and there's no blame here at all, right? I mean, I was I was part of the intelligence community, Glenn was part of it, so no blame here, right? We should have put more effort into pandemics. You know, we should be putting more effort into understanding the vulnerability of supply chains um, for all sorts of products, right? That are important to our national security that I don't think we do today. Um, we should be putting a much greater effort into having the expertise and the collection to understand where different countries are on the key technologies of the future. And I know that's a great interest of folks, but you know, do we have, do we really have inside the community the people who have a real deep understanding of artificial intelligence who can look at what a particular Chinese firm is doing or the Chinese government is doing and really be able to explain to a president where they are relative to where we are. Um, you know, maybe another way of looking at this and then, and then, you know, ask Glenn what he thinks here, but another way of looking at this is, you know, as I think about 
what are the existential threats to the United States of America? I only see three. I only see three things at the end of the day that can, that can cause the United States of America to cease to exist. And you would think that we would focus on all three of those, right? Like a laser. Well, the first is nuclear war between the United States and Russia, right? We focus on that. Um, two is a pandemic, right? Um, we're actually lucky that, 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 that the coronavirus is not more um, lethal than it is, right? It, it, it is highly virulent, uh, uh, but it could be more lethal and we would be in a much, much more difficult place, right? We could lose millions and millions of people rather than 100,000. Uh, and then the third is climate change, right? Um, climate change could evolve to the point where we could not survive on this planet, right? So, so of the three things that are the greatest threat to our existence, we really only focus on one of them in the intelligence community. Glenn, additional thoughts on those uh, risk areas? I think Michael's hit it right on the head. Uh, the, as I said, the, the simple fact of the matter is that uh, the world has changed due to technological development so rapidly over the last decade or two. Our intelligence community and indeed the rest of society generally has been very slow to catch up in a wide range of areas. And so no surprise that our government, in the, particularly in the national security sector, hasn't moved as quickly as, as, as we need to. And it unfortunately takes some crises. This is a particularly horrible way to learn, but unfortunately it takes crises to uh, to learn where there are some deficiencies and we are sadly learning learning the price of that. Again, no blame in, in any regard, uh, but it's clearly something we now absolutely recognize we need to focus on. So when you look at the traditional missions of the Intel community, uh, we've been able to respond to those best through what Intel community, what, what Intel agencies do, what Intel operatives do, they steal secrets. Um, as we realign the priorities of the Intel community and we uh, spend more effort or, or raise priority of things like the pandemic, uh, things like uh, economic uh, uh, after effects from something like a pandemic, climate change, much of that information uh, that's available is available in open source. And, um, and it's available in extremely large volumes. So uh, let me toss that one to you, Glenn. Um, how, how do we respond to that? Is it the role of the Intel community to, to uh, attack that large volume of open source information or should they just stick with stealing secrets? So I think it's an absolutely inevitable consequence of the shift to broaden national security uh, uh, collection to a wider range to look at economic matters, pandemic matters, technological matters, et cetera. It's absolutely inevitable that once we make that decision, and I think that is absolutely the right decision, and I know Michael agrees, uh, that we are going to have to rely on so-called open source material. Our intelligence communities were set up to dig for secrets, as you said, Larry, uh, in, in adversaries' networks uh, to find out about their secret weapon systems, their secret political communications, et cetera. Uh, they weren't set up necessarily to look for information available publicly. And of course, now everything's available publicly, right? Again, a big change from 20 years ago, but due to the advent of multiple platforms, communications technology, the advent of social media, et cetera, all sorts of information is now available far more than any government could ever deal with, analyze, understand, et cetera. So I think the challenge actually is how can we avail ourselves of this massive amount of information? And if we think it's massive now, wait till we really get to the point where artificial intelligence generates and consumes uh, massive amounts of data, much of which will be stored in the cloud and elsewhere, and think of how, it, how, how much data is going to be available about everything from movements to business trends, et cetera. So understanding this is going to be a, a huge task. But a perfect example, a very small example of just how relevant this is, is the fact that the first information about the COVID-19 uh, outbreak came not necessarily from intelligence community reports or not necessarily from WHO, World Health Organization reports, but reports in Chinese social media about hospitals filling up. And that was picked up by some local newspapers, which in turn was picked up by the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. And that was sort of the very first indications of that there was an unusual disease going on, along with some phone calls back and forth from Chinese doctors to their colleagues in America. But again, my point is that wasn't something that was collected by the CIA or NSA. So that's a perfect example. This is going to require a culture change. Uh, as I said, our agencies weren't necessarily focused on this. They're very open to it. 
Um, and it's going to require a whole new level of public-private partnership because this data is in the hands of the private sector. And, uh, and that, that's gonna require some significant changes, but it will produce powerful results. So it sounds like um, the Intel community needs to do more than they're currently doing. It sounds like they need to invest in technologies that uh, they maybe don't currently have. Um, both of those are going to require um, resources, money and people and, and technology. Uh, yeah, the, can, I, can I jump in and say something about open source first? Yeah, please, please, Mike. Open source question. Um, so open source has always played a role in the intelligence community, right? There has always been an organization responsible for um, acquiring the open source information that we need to do our job. Um, it's always been true. And even before the pandemic, and even before um, an argument by Glenn and Michael to expand you know, the definition of national security here a bit, um, there was a significant need for more open source. Even before we had this, this COVID moment, there was a need for more open source. Um, not only a need, but the, but it was there, right? Huge amounts of data, and also the analytic tools to put on top of that data. And there absolutely is an openness by the intelligence community to do more of that. But what it has to do is it has to figure out a way to be aware of what's out there. I mean, you know, we have Incutel, but Incutel can only do so much. They can only invest in so many companies. Um, you know, they don't have perfect vision into all of the different technologies and data that are out there. Um, so there needs to be awareness. Um, there needs to be a door in the intelligence community that if you're a company and you think you've got data or you think you have uh, a tool to put on top of data that would be helpful to the intelligence community, there should be a door that you can knock on and say, hey, I'm here to help you, right? That door does not exist today. Right. Today, if you're one of those companies, you have to you have to find a former senior intelligence official, right, to help you make the contact, right? Exactly. And then and then you have to resolve all the issues associated with bringing that data and those tools in. And and some of them are very serious issues like security and like making sure we don't mix U.S. person data, right, with 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 foreign data, um, as Glenn can talk about, you know, um, um, you know, in great detail. Um, having it work with the IT system. Um, but then also you have the cultural issue that Glenn talked about, which we should not underestimate, right? It has, it has long been believed that if top secret or secret is stamped at the top of a document, that that is somehow more valuable than a document that has unclassified stamped at the top of it. And that's a cultural thing that we need to get over. Um, I don't think we invest enough. I, I didn't think before the pandemic we invested enough in open source and we needed to do more. And now I believe that even more strongly. Before the pandemic, I thought we needed a separate agency to focus on open source collection. Um, and boy, um, does the pandemic uh, reinforce that view for me. So um, getting back to the to the question I was beginning to, to, to move forward into then, it, it sounds like we need to spend more money, but uh, uh, we're, you know, going through a significant economic shock from this pandemic. That's going to take some time to work its way through. There are going to be a lot of pressure on the federal budget uh, to spend money in public health preparedness, homeland security issues. So how does so? So number one, uh, you advocate uh, an increase in in the expenditures towards intelligence. Um, how would you make that happen? And do you think it's realistic that uh, that the intelligence community can compete favorably in that environment? And should perhaps an alternative be for the agencies to um, to reprioritize the spending within existing amounts? Yeah, I'd say two Michael. things. I'd say a couple of things. One is um, one is prior to the pandemic, I believe that the resources weren't where they needed to be, right? And for me, you know. The, the numbers that really stand out to me are, you know, the, the number of, of staff employees at CIA is classified, right? But um, mm -hmm. in 1991, it was X. 
In 2001, because of the so-called peace dividend from the end of the Cold War, it was 0.75x, so a 25% decline. You know, post 9-11, significant increase, but when I walked out the door in 2013, it was only 1.1x. So roughly the same number of staff employees at CIA in 2013 as there were in 1991 in a world that was much, much more complicated, right, in 2013 than in 2001. So we needed more then. And if we're going to expand the definition of national security here and take more on, and if the and if the government is going to say to us, we're going to give you some additional responsibility with regard to issues like pandemic or climate change or supply chains, um, then, you know, we're going to have to be resourced for it. Now, do I expect the intelligence community to get significant new resources? No, absolutely not, right? You know, we put the line in there about shifting, you know, um, shifting a little bit of money from DOD to, to the intelligence community just, just to show the significant disparity, right, in the size of the two budgets. But, you know, Mark Esper's not going to give up 1% of his budget. He's just not. Um, so at the end of the day, we might get some additional money on the margins, right, as people focus on on preparing for the next pandemic. Um, and we're gonna have to move around some money internally. You know, we're gonna have to make some choices internally, but I don't expect um, I don't expect us to be handed all the resources that we're gonna need. So Glenn, uh, in that vein, um, are there more creative ways the intelligence community could get additional resources? Are there public private partnerships that perhaps could be uh, obtained? Uh, are there redefinitions of what it means to work for the intelligence community uh, that could be uh, developed? Uh, you know, you, you, you more recently in the intel community than Michael and myself, I know those kinds of discussions have been taking place at NSA and at CIA. Uh, can you shed some light in that, in that area? Sure, Larry. There's, I think, um, uh, following up on what Michael just said, I think there's a whole bunch of things that, uh, that we can look at um, in no particular order. Uh, as we shift more to looking at open source material and to use documents that, as Michael said, aren't are, are, are stamped unclassified at top, um, that means that we might be able to do some work, an increased portion of our work, uh, with with a workforce that isn't necessarily uh, subject to the full security clearances. There, there's certainly some some portion of work in dealing with open source information that could be done by people who don't necessarily uh, have a full clearance because they don't need to. And, and that's an expensive process for contractors to maintain clearances, for the agencies to go around uh, undertaking security investigations, et cetera. So there's a significant cost there. I'm not saying that's a panacea. It's not going to solve everything. But shifting some work to, to an unclassified workforce is a step in the right direction and certainly will enable the NSAs and CIAs and DIAs of the world to attract um, some terrific talent. So that's that's one. Uh, secondly, uh, there's no question that, uh, that we need to rely more on the private sector to fill in some gaps and provide some information. And again, that doesn't necessarily have to be done at taxpayer expense. So to the extent we can cause more cooperation with the private sector, to the extent we can look at open source information that after all is free uh, and doesn't require clandestine means to acquire it, to the extent that we can get better better interagency co cooperation as we understand what we now need to look at and recognize we're not just simply looking at a uh, the architecture of Russian submarines, but we're looking at something much broader. Uh, maybe we can avail ourselves of expertise located outside the intelligence community in USDA, in the Department of the Interior, in the H uh, Health and Human Services, et cetera, and, and create more of a fusion effort to understand the information that is available to us for not that much money. So there's a bunch of steps we can take. Admittedly, they're all incremental. I'm not suggesting that any one of them is going to solve the problem. But if we put our minds to it and make some incremental efforts and we get some additional funds uh, even slightly, that'll, that'll that, that, that's a significant amount of leverage and that'll produce significant dividends. So the last uh, piece in your op-ed that you talked about was uh, uh, a subject we've actually been talking about as a nation quite a bit since 2016, and that was disinformation. Uh, in that prior context, that had more to do with suborning our elections, but now we see disinformation being used by China, by Russia, by Iran, by others to try to uh, place blame, for example, uh, on the coronavirus on the United States, uh, to uh, to try to bolster the the point that the Chinese are are doing wonderful things around the globe to help people. Um, you know what what is going on here, uh, Glenn? What can we do to stop it? 
Um, and you know, should we be counterpunching with our own disinformation? Sadly, this topic of disinformation is going to become one of ever greater prominence. And what we've seen in the past uh, few months with China making an effort to shift the blame for the coronavirus away from itself and its mis missteps initially to the United States to try to show that their system of government is better at tackling this than the West uh, is, is a harbinger of, of what, what we're going to see more of, uh, not less of. Um, I think our nation was caught a little flat-footed, as you alluded to, in 2016, where we saw a significant attempt, a very concerted attempt by uh, Russia and the Internet Research Agency um, to, to have an influence in our uh, presidential elections. In 2018, in the midterm elections, I think the United States was a little better postured. Uh, as was publicly reported, the National Security Agency, working hand-in-hand -hand with the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Homeland Security, et cetera, took really some extraordinary steps to make sure that uh, that election was as relatively free as it could be from both into interference, actual election result tinkering, uh, as well as influence. Uh, you're never going to really be able to stop the influence because, of course, we have adversaries who are taking advantage of our First Amendment rights. I mean, it's possible for a foreign adversary to come in, use our platforms, which and, and benefit from the First Amendment protections we have. So it's a serious problem. What's complicating this is the fact that it's not just simply Russia, it's China. We've seen how they've done this not only in the United States, but they've pushed back uh, on the European Union in their recent report that uh, in an effort to water down some complaints about Chinese disinformation. Uh, and we're seeing this, of course, also from other governments, uh, North Korea, Iran, elsewhere. Um, so this is something that's going to be very, very significant. It's going to require a multifaceted effort for us to deal with. This is not just an intelligence community problem at all. It is a leadership problem for the United States. It is a, it is a problem that can be addressed in part, but only in part, by greater civic education, more informed public, more sophisticated approaches using for social media. It, it's not a simple problem. And unfortunately, it is going to get worse before it gets better, if indeed it ever does get better. Michael? So I would just add, I agree with all of that. I would just add that, um, you know, to your question, should we, the United States of America, be in the disinformation business? I would say absolutely not. Um, and I'd say absolutely not for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that um, we're the ones who live in a glass house here. We are the most open country in the world. Um, and, you know, to for us to throw stones at other countries sends the signal that it's okay for everybody to throw stones at us. So I think we would see if we went into the disinformation business in a big way, you know, we would we would see other nations join Russia and China and Iran um, in, in playing that game at all. And I don't think, you know, we want to do that. And if we're going to criticize other nations for um, for playing in the disinformation space, then the last thing we should do is tell them that's okay. And the other point I would add is that is that the effectiveness of the United States doing this um, would be much less than the effectiveness of the adversaries doing it to us, right? They're, they're, closed, they're closed societies. They control their media. So if we were to, to dig up dirt on Vladimir Putin or make up dirt on Vladimir Putin and push it into the Russian uh, information space, he can control that, right, to a significant degree and to a degree that we can't control that kind of thing here. So not only does it send the wrong signal um, to the rest of the world for us to do it, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as effective as their capabilities. What we should do, Larry, is we should be very, very active in the information space, right, with the truth, um, which we did very effectively during the Cold War. Um, so we need to come back to what messages do we want to send the rest of the world about all sorts of issues and be very aggressive about that, but stay on the side of the truth. And so the I, distinction. I, I, to, I, can I, yeah, sure, Glenn, go ahead. Let, uh, Michael makes a terrific point. Um, let me add one more one more thought to that also, which is uh, disinformation uh, in a way complicates the third point we were talking about, which is getting more resources, which is to say. To the extent that the there's some disinformation, say pushed by the Chinese or whatever, that the real source of this virus was a CIA plot. 
Um, that creates a little bit of mistrust or distrust. It's completely ludicrous, of course, and 99% of the people recognize that. But, you know, someone's going to think, well, gee, I don't know, maybe there's something. It just adds to a level of mistrust or distrust about our institutions. It's, it's just really pernicious. And it, this erosion of legitimacy, coupled with lots of other factors we could all talk about, creates a situation where uh, it, it's slightly more difficult for our intelligence community and our government to go to the American public and say, we need more resources. We need your support. We're doing a terrific job. We can do an even better job. And this is not limited, of course, to the intelligence community, but, but it is going to be true that the disinformation is going to undercut a sense of legitimacy and therefore a sense of trust in our public institutions. The, the, uh, the, the antidote to that is greater leadership. And I think that's what we're going to need to see across the board. I'm not making a political statement. I'm just simply saying that that is Republican or Democrat, doesn't make a difference. Uh, we are going to have to take affirmative action to counter this information. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, the, uh, as with these, uh, and Michael, I know you must, you'll sympathize with me here. I've got several pages more of questions that I'm not going to get to, but uh, uh, I want to remind the audience, if you have questions, I see uh, several of you already sent in questions, uh, but now would be the time to get them to me. We're going to start going with audience questions here in about another minute, uh, but I didn't want to let this session slide by without talking to Michael about another op-ed uh, that was written, I think, in Foreign Affairs? Foreign Policy, Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, Michael wrote a piece with two other former Deputy Directors of CIA, Avril Haines and uh, David Cohen. And um, you suggested that at this critical time for this nation, when we're grappling with this horrible pandemic, uh, that uh, uh, perhaps this current administration is politicizing intelligence. Um, would you like to kind of walk us briefly through, uh, you know, the, the, the points you made and, and why you feel that way and, and what we can do about it? So the piece makes the piece makes two points. Um, the first point um, is a point that everybody knows, right? Which is the president has um, put an awful lot of pressure um, on the intelligence community to see issues the way he sees them. Um, you know, whether it's it's uh, calling out his his intelligence community leadership team after the worldwide threat testimony in 2019. Um, when they told the committee that Iran was acting consistent with the nuclear deal or that they ha they had serious doubts that Kim Jong-un would ever give up his nuclear weapons and he fired back at them for that and told them to go back to school um, or some of the statements he's made in front of Vladimir Putin where he's he's taken Putin's word for it rather than the IC's word put a lot of pressure on the community by what he says and more recently over the last six to nine months, he's put a lot of pressure on the community in terms of the people he has fired for doing their job in speaking truth to power. So that's that's point one, right? An awful lot of pressure put on the community that, that everybody knows about. Point number two is, is the three of us saying, look, we think that that pressure is really starting to have an impact. Um, and we point to a whole bunch of different things. Um, the IC's leadership's unwillingness to do the worldwide threat testimony this year. Um, some of the statements made by members of Congress who say, you know, when we get briefed by working level officials, we hear one thing. And when we get briefed by IC leaders, we hear, you know, something a little bit different, um, which would suggest maybe that the IC leaders are you know, shading what they're saying a little bit in front of Congress. Um, so we point to a number of things that we, that suggest to us that maybe, maybe this intelligence community that for the last three years has been under intense pressure um, from the president to be politicized is starting to crack a little bit. And that's, that's the warning that we wanted to put out there. And at the, at, as you know, Larry, at the end of the, at the end of the day, there's nothing more important than the intelligence community being objective and being seen as objective, right? And if it loses either one of those two things, then its usefulness to the nation um, declines significantly. So one of the questions we have from the audience to segue here uh, is uh, uh, if you two gentlemen would be willing to comment on the this morning from Mark Mazzetti. Uh, 
that uh, suggests that the getting back to your polit politicization uh, that there is pressure being put on the intel community to um, to link the wuhan labs to the release of this coronavirus and that they're uh, they're, they're they're making the parallel being what was you know what happened with uh, dick cheney and uh, Saddam Hussein's links to Al Qaeda. You know, keep asking the question, keep pressuring because you you have a conclusion you want the intel community to come to, and by asking that question repeatedly, you'll get it. Um, Michael, you obviously had uh, involvement in the Iraq situation. Do you see parallels? Uh, do you think uh, that's uh, maybe just a little bit overreacting at this point? So I say two things. One is I don't know, right? If the New York Times article is accurate. Um, I don't know what questions the White House has been asking the intelligence community, so it, it is impossible for me to judge whether they're asking the questions in a way that would suggest that they want a particular answer. Uh, the second thing I would say, though, is that the, the Office of the DNI put out a statement this morning um, about this very issue, and the statement said two things. The statement said that um, we do not believe that this virus was man-made. You know, we've come to that judgment. This was a naturally occurring virus. This was not man-made. On the question of whether it, it jumped from an animal to a human in nature or whether it was a virus that escaped from the lab is an open question that we're still looking at. So they put out that statement this morning, probably in response to the New York Times article. Um, my view on that is that it was a terrific statement to put out. Um, so here's a here's a here's a, a situation where um, the intelligence community, not just by not just by me and Avril and David um, being concerned about politicization, but Senator Mark Warner being concerned about politicization. Right, so a lot of people are being concerned about politicization. Two is you've got senior administration officials all over the map about the origins of this virus, right? You have Secretary Pompeo being very aggressive in blaming the Chinese, and you've got Secretary Esper who's, who's saying, look, we really don't know the origin. So you've got administration officials all over the map here on what is a very, very important issue, right, of, of, of where this virus came from. So I think it was perfectly appropriate and a very good idea for the DNI to put out this statement. And the statement, showed me no politicization, right? There was absolutely no politicization at all in the way the DNI put out that statement. So I'm actually heartened by the fact that they put it out and by the way it was worded. Larry, I would, I would uh, completely underscore what Michael just, just said, no surprise. But let me just add one point on the substance, which is if you think about it, um, uh, uncovering the actual truth, whether this was something that was passed directly, was an animal pathogen that passed from an animal to a human directly, or whether it somehow was being investigated in a, in a Wuhan bio lab and through some horrific accident passed to a human, um, is probably may well be something we'll never know. Unless we actually, if you think about the kind of intelligence that we need to uncover, we'd really have to find some kind of smoking gun, some, some kind of uh, email or some admission on the part of Chinese that there was an accident and it was covered up and so on and so forth. And that may or may not have happened. It may or may not exist, finding it, et cetera. So I wouldn't be at all surprised, although it's terribly important we understand this, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we never end up with the actual definitive answer here. Right. And, I, and, I agree. And, and Larry, let me just add one more thing here. Um, so I agree 100%, 100% with Glenn. Um, just add one more thing. Um, you, you know, many people don't know this, but the United States government in the form of NIH um, was providing funding to the Wuhan lab to um, assist them in doing their research on, the, on, on many different kinds of coronaviruses. Um, and we now, we know, right, from, from State Department, the State Department cables that there were concerns in the United States government about the safety protocols at that lab, right? So if it did escape from the lab, not only bad on China, but also bad on the United States, for providing funding for research to a lab that had safety concerns. So if it did escape, we're all in this together, right? This is this is somehow not, you know, not a gotcha for for China, right? This is a gotcha for both of us. So next question, uh, great question, audience. How is General Hayden 
Uh, so first, I'd like to note that General Hayden is among you. He is one of, he and his wife are among the participants attending this event. Uh, he asked uh, to not take time away from the event to speak at this uh, at this point in time. Uh, he's doing great. Uh, he and I had quite a long phone conversation last night uh, to help prepare me for the event. Uh, he's active on Twitter. Um, he's getting stronger every day, but uh, as with many of us, given given the fact that he suffered the stroke, he uh, he's having to really quarantine himself in his house. And so uh, um, uh, in, probably wishes he was out and about amongst all of us uh, as the rest of us do. So, um, you know, quick greeting to General Hayden and thanks for asking that question. Uh, Michael or Glenn? Yeah, I just, I just want to say it's interesting that we've got, we've got Michael Morrell from CIA and we got Glenn Gerstel from NSA, right? The two organizations that General Hayden led um, so capably. And I would just say that, that I know, I know in CIA and I'm sure in NSA, and Glenn can add to this, that General Hayden is absolutely beloved, absolutely beloved. The next question from the audience, great question. Um, <clears throat> the role of the DNI is to coordinate and consolidate the different types of intelligence, human, amazing, SIGINT, open source, et cetera, that are being collected. Well, one of the results of this, uh, the after action reports on this pandemic be perhaps an increase in the importance of the DNI, an increase in his authorities. Um, I would throw into that a question I had in my queue here that was, uh, um, you know, we have uh, a lot of concern amongst a number of former Intel officials about the individuals being nominated or serving in acting capacities uh, at the ODNI. We, we may have a confirmation hearing for uh, Congressman John Ratcliffe next week. Um, are there questions that Congress should be asking next week uh, when this confirmation hearing takes place um, that would reflect on those ODNI authorities? Uh, I'll start with you, Glenn. So um, it, I certainly think it would be natural to ascribe a greater role to the DNI uh, in light of the comments we're making about expanding the scope of the national security, sort of broadening the definition, so to speak, and a logical place to house that broadened definition would be in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, as opposed to one of the uh, various components of, 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 the, uh, of the intelligence community. So you could easily see a broadened uh, role, uh, an integrating, uh, coordinating role for the DNI. Um, the, look, the, uh, there, there's no question that the DNI, uh, the, the ODNI, Office itself has been a has been a troubled one. It was set up in the aftermath of the 9/11 uh, terrorist attacks as an effort to coordinate uh, intelligence community, which had been accused of being too stoved pipe, to, to having too much information just in one one agency's hands, not not spread around in others. And I think uh, you'd have to give the DNI, as it's stood up over the past uh, decade, more than a decade, um, some pretty good grades for breaking down the barriers between between organizations. But even so, I don't think anyone would give it an A plus. I'm not blaming any one particular person, but it wasn't given the full tools, the full resources. There was some ambivalence over its role and exactly how much power it would have over all the intelligence agencies. So it ended up being a little bit neither fish nor fowl, to use an old fashioned expression. And as a result, I think has been hampered. Another factor, no surprise, has been it's uh, undergoing a series of leadership changes. Uh, Dan Coates, uh, under this administration, served uh, for a, a significant amount of time, but then he's been replaced by several acting people, um, including ones who at least on paper uh, do not appear to, to meet the statutory requirement of having someone who has deep experience in intelligence matters. And that's something that Congress is going to have to satisfy itself on, which is exactly their role. Michael. The only thing I would add is that, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd zoom out a little bit, is I do believe, not right now, but I do believe at some point um, in the future here, um, we, need, we need an official commission on um, this pandemic, right? We need to look at um, all aspects of the government and the societal response here and learn as many lessons as we can um, for what happened here and how we responded and how we could have responded better so that we're better prepared for the next pandemic because I guarantee you there's gonna be another pandemic. You know, 100% certain evolutionary biology tells you that. So as part of that, you would look at the intelligence community, right? Um, and as part of looking at the intelligence community, you would look at the role of the DNI and um, 
whether or not uh, his role or her role um, needs to be expanded um, in order to be better prepared. Along those lines, there are several people who have asked this question. A number of them are students uh, at different universities around the country. Uh, should consideration be given to folding more elements of the U.S. government into the intel community, or should have some elements of government that don't have an intel capacity be developing that? Uh, I think they were thinking in terms of uh, HHS, uh, CDC, uh, other organizations like that. Thoughts? Uh, I'll throw it to you, Glenn. Yeah, I'm not particularly a fan of expanding uh, intelligence. Uh, capabilities uh, and having them multiply throughout uh, government so that each particular agency has its own little intelligence function. I think that's going to lead to more fractured analysis and less cohesion. Uh, by the same token, we need to avail ourselves in the intelligence community of the expertise that is housed in, in particular places. So Michael alluded earlier today uh, to uh, the expertise that exists within Treasury for financial matters. Uh, clearly, uh, that you can't completely replicate that within the intelligence community. And yet, on the other hand, uh, we certainly don't want uh, the Department of the Treasury to create its own mini CIA. So some adroit balance between having a smaller, tighter, effective intelligence community uh, that is able to draw upon in a more coordinated way uh, with fewer uh, turf battles with the areas that do have expertise is clearly what's needed. And I think to go back to Michael's point about a national commission, uh, which is going to shed more more light, more than just light on the pandemic response, but we'll talk about our structure, our architecture. I think if we have a commission that is able to look at some of those issues and come up with structural changes, that would be for the good. Michael. And Larry, um, it is a very good question. Um, and I think what I would say is um, in the revision of the executive order that governs intelligence activities, uh, 12333, that revision that was done um, after the creation of the DNI. There's language in there about the DNI having the ability to reach across government, including outside the intelligence community, to reach across government to get the information that he or she needs in order to protect the country. So one of the, what, what, the most important concept here to me is is the information that's available at CDC and NIH and other places that are traditionally outside the intelligence community, is that information making its way to the intelligence community, right? Um, and you don't need to be part of the intelligence community in order to have that information be provided. The DNI's got that authority today. Actually, thank you for the reminder. I think I was involved in helping write some of those passages in that executive order. Um, another great question we're getting from a number of people, uh, including reporters, and I think just just concerned American citizens. Um, we have a pandemic going on. It's affecting all of our private lives. It's affecting all of our work lives. Um, many American citizens are now working from home, and they're able to somewhat successfully do that. But that clearly is a problem for the U.S. intel community. Um, we, uh, I'm hearing anecdotally stories about uh, you know, some of the agencies having a week on, week off, or or multiple shifts during the day. Uh, there are instances of people being just furloughed uh, with pay uh, because their functions are considered not critical. Um, how should the intelligence community be planning? for the future for, as you said, Michael, another one of these will happen. You know, having uh, more than half of your workforce derailed at any given moment is, you know, not serving the taxpayer need, that's for sure. We're spending a lot of money on the Intel community to have a bunch of it sitting idle is not good. Um, so uh, Glenn, you've got the technology focus, perhaps there's a technology solution. Um, maybe you can talk to the impact the pandemic might be having on intelligence collection and operations today, and then, solutions that might uh, that we might be looking towards sure great great question larry and um you know let me start by saying uh that in some ways uh i don't want to draw the parallel too strongly but in some ways the members of the intelligence community who are going into the office because they have they have they have to they can't tell the work from home the classified information exists inside secure spaces in government offices and so in order to keep the country safe they must be in the office uh, either every day or on split shifts. In some ways, 
Uh, they're a little bit akin you know, for the national security sector to our uh, doctors and nurses on the front line. I, I'm not taking anything away from our doctors and nurses who truly are on the front line, but I think we do owe, uh, the nation owes a, a, some gratitude to the people in the intelligence community who are taking a greater risk because they can't work from home. So more, more specifically to your point, Larry, um, uh, it's possible that as we move more to open source information, as I alluded to before, we could shift some functions uh, to a situation where we could work from home. Clearly, the, the government could do a little more in terms of assisting in teleworking across the federal government generally, and particularly in the intelligence community, where not everything needs to be in a secure environment. And then finally, um, uh, you can envision technology helping us a little bit with, with some form of, of some kind of uh, secure remote access for certain information. Other information is going to clearly have to be handled in what's called a SCIF, a, a, an actual secure physical facility. Uh, but even there, it's possible to design things so that there could be a little greater social distancing. We're gonna be learning a lot from what restaurants and shopping malls and, and other retails uh, and the rest of our economy does in terms of social distancing for the next few months. And we should learn some of those lessons and apply them uh, to, uh, to the intelligence community secure facilities. So Michael, uh, probably the last question uh, to, to wrap up on that, um, number of the questions specifically zeroed in on human operations. How can we conduct human operations in a pandemic? Obviously without getting into sources and methods, but uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a little bit tricky, right? Um, um, so I think the piece that gets affected, right, significantly is the, the uh, spotting and assessing and development of new sources, right? Those are the people you actually have to meet. Um, once somebody is a s actual source providing intelligence, um, you know, how you get that information can be, can happen in a variety of different ways um, and doesn't require face-to-face -face contact. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, don't want to go any deeper than that, but I would, the point I'm trying to make is that I think probably the development of new sources is being affected more than um, sources providing information today with one caveat, right? Um, around the world, people aren't going to work, right? And that might include some of our sources. Um, and so they might not, not be in a position of access simply because they're at home rather than at work. All right. Well, we've had a very rich dialogue here. We've covered quite a lot of areas around the pandemic. There, I'm, you know, I still have several questions I'd love to ask. And there was a very long list of questions from the audience members. So I apologize to those audience members uh, to whom I, I was not able to address your question. Um, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Glenn, for your time and your participation today. I know uh, our audience members, which included students from around the uh, George Mason University, other universities around the country, even around the world, interested citizens, uh, current government workers were, uh, were logging in. Uh, I, think, uh, I think this has been very, very useful. Thank you. I'd like to now turn it back over to Mark for some concluding remarks. Great. Great. Thank you, Larry. Uh, wonderful program. I'm absolutely delighted. I learned a lot. So I just wanted to let everybody know that we have another program tomorrow in our week-long series of noon webinars on the pandemic and public policy issues. Uh, somewhat provocative session tomorrow, the title Crisis and Power Grabbing, Government Expansion of Power During the Pandemic. And the short description is national leaders in the US and elsewhere are exploiting the coronavirus lockdown to their own benefit. Elites are expanding their power, siphoning money, creating social discord that may undermine efforts to recover from the crisis. Corruption has never had it so good. Uh, so we have a distinguished panel of uh, scholars tomorrow at noon. I hope you can join us and thank you for attending today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Glenn. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Larry. You.